I want to welcome in our guy, Tom Murphy, who we get a chance to talk to every Monday and Thursday at 7.20 this morning. Tom, I appreciate your time as always, buddy. I think it's a little worrisome for the Arkansas defense uh, for the rest of the way as, as Texas A&M really just bullied them up front. Uh, how, how concerning is the defensive line and how they look to be manhandled on Saturday? Look for this football team who's playing a pretty good Tennessee offensive line next weekend or this weekend. Well, that's an interesting take, and um, A&M's blueprint, I'm not sure how many teams can duplicate that. I mean, Alabama certainly would have the chance, too, with their line. Tennessee would want to, but the problem Tennessee would face is their their quarterback, even though he's a veteran in Garantano, I don't think quite has the poise and the accuracy that, that Mond has developed to this point. So um, I'm sure Tennessee will try to do those things. And, and let's not forget one thing here. Every year when I watch Arkansas A&M, it, it kind of flares up again in my memory, and then you forget about it, and then you're watching the game again, and then you're like, oh, yeah, A&M is about the most grabby offensive line in, in the conference. And then they must be expert teachers at blocking and then just the inside hand grabs or whatever they do. They got called for a couple of holdings or maybe three. One of them I didn't think was legit. But there were several others where – a Grant Morgan or a, a D lineman who's rushing, you see them make contact, and then the, the linebacker, in Morgan's case, pulling away. But no, he's being held on to and pretty blatant. So I'm not saying that their success is due to that. I'm just saying they get away with it, um, and it's hard to call it, I mean, on every play. So and they're not going look, to. Respect where it's due. That's a veteran O line, and they're good, but also, you know, they get away with some stuff. Let me, Tom, let me ask you something about that. Because there was one I remember where Grant was clearly getting held. They didn't call it. I mean, I don't think that was the, the make or break of the football game. But if that's happening on one side of the football, what's to say that Brad Davis and his staff can't try to do the same thing? And then also to your point about how, how many calls do you think, uh, like, because I've seen at certain points this season, the refs are just kind of letting it play. And I enjoy sometimes just letting them play. But do you think they're also trying to just let some calls go in order to get the game along quicker and end it? faster this season based on everything we have with COVID right now? You know, <clears throat> yeah, games that are um, marred by way too many penalties, like you see some NFL games where they're called three, four plays in a row, you get so tired of that. Mm -hmm. Nobody really wants to see that. Uh, you'd like to see them set the tone um, by calling some stuff maybe early. It, it's just hard to say. Uh, people can tell you can call holding on every play, um, but I don't, there's a technique to it, and we could spend a lot of time talking about it. But I think quite often you just try to block a guy, and then if you're beaten or uh, a guy's going to get to a gap that's supposed to be one you're clearing out, sometimes you just do a little little hold. And a lot of times you'll see there'll be a little interior hold, and then but if you let the guy go, um, then they 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 they're more lenient on that. So it's just hard to it's hard to reconcile the whole thing, other than to say. I thought there were a few blatant ones the other night that they got away with. All right, so Rakeem Boyd had 100 yards. Felipe Frank scrambled out of the pocket for 91. Arkansas collected 222 on the ground, which you, you would think is good enough numbers to win. And then you add 239 yards through the air. Is it, it just Does it just boil down to the fact that Arkansas's defense couldn't force enough three and outs? It was into the fourth quarter before you got those. Uh, yeah. What was, was that the difference? For, for me, that was the difference is you know, your defense couldn't force enough punts. I think absolutely. The offense offense played well enough, and some of those were some new stuff they put in for Franks, and and they worked. I mean, a couple of times A um, and M had guys that that got into those gaps, but um, a lot of the misdirection, play fakes, option reads uh, looked promising for you know as, as things go along for Arkansas. And seven of eleven third down conversions, and I think at one point they were seven of eight or six of seven. It just they converted one after the other, and there were several long ones. I mean, there was one long one that came after two holding penalties on the same drive, and I think that was when the score was fourteen to seven a And M. So let's just say you get off the field on that one, it could be a different game because Arkansas uh, their offense was going pretty good. They bogged down inside the Tennessee forty or thirty a few times and, and missed some long range field goals, but. 
Um, otherwise, that's one of the best offensive efforts we've seen all year, and I think something to build on. Um, and then, and then I don't think you're going to see the exact combo of a really good offensive line, a good trio of running backs like A&M had, and then a veteran quarterback who Mom doesn't look to run it as much, but by gosh, on that one, he, he saw the pocket kind of collapse and slide, and there was a gap o- over the left side, and he got a huge gain out of it, made bumper pool miss. So I don't think you're going to see that combo until maybe the Alabama game, and Mac Jones isn't as nimble, um, and then, then they'll see the rest of the year. So um, I don't think it bodes ill for, say, the Tennessee game. Tennessee has its offensive issues, and I think you'll see a little bit of a rebound by the Razorbacks, and the game will be at home. Yeah, let's go back to the opening offensive possession for Arkansas. 12 plays, 87 yards, took just under five minutes. Arkansas scores on their opening drive. It looked like they had spent two weeks scripting this out, working on it. Eight oh, yeah. rushes, I believe it was, eight of the 12 plays uh, they kept on the ground. Uh, Tom, I don't know. To me, that would look like the best offensive possession of the season. I don't know if you share that opinion, but to me, that looked like the best series of plays Arkansas has put together this season. Yeah, one of the best, no doubt about it. Uh, They've had a few other really nice TD drives, but that one was clearly their best opening drive because it's the only one that resulted in points. But a really nice mixture. Yes, you can tell they scripted it. A quarterback run was in there. Frank's had a 28-yarder. They established Rakeem Boyd on the first play of the game, which was really nice to see. Uh, Frank's went four for four on the drive. Um, and uh, Traylon Burks ran a really nice jab step inside and then out cut and got space. And Frank delivered it right on target. Um, yeah, boy, that was just well-oiled. Sam Pittman even said after the game, really proud that they started that way. And, you know, you see how you become a, a really good team is you continue to build, you improve, um, and they and you can see that the offense is getting better. The line played a little better. Boyd ran harder. There were bigger creases for him to get through. I, I think it, there's a few other items that they need to clean up. Frank has either got to get rid of the ball or decide he's going to go faster than he's doing because some of these sacks are just simply because he's he's been moving around for four seconds. And they finally get to him. So they clean that up. Uh, I think they're on their way to being a much better offense. So what happened? What stalled the momentum? Because Arkansas went three and out. They ran it twice, threw it on third and seven, and had to punt. Uh, What changed from drive one to to drive two, other than obviously not getting 10 yards and moving the chains? Uh, Why did they look so, so different in the second drive when they came out and had the second possession? Yeah, I, I can't explain exactly why. I mean, obviously they um, they went to the sideline, and then did, and Mike Elko and, and his staff made some tweaks um, in the first two run play. I believe they ran on first and second down mm-hmm. on their second series. They just kind of bottled those up. And I'll tell you, more and more teams are, are blitzing, and it turns into run blitzes, and there's just too many hats to block. And, and there's contact made near the line of scrimmage, and that happens some. And sometimes you break – break through when there's run blitzes and you get bigger gains. But A&M won those two plays for sure. And I think they forced um, uh, a throw out of bounds by Franks on third down. So a really non-productive drive. But those things happen sometimes. And, and A&M you know, won the first two plays and that set the tone for that series. Tom Murphy with us here on the Morning Rush. Tom, Jalen Catalong was ejected late in the first quarter. Sam Pittman said after the game he agreed with the call. I don't think there was a lot of dispute that that play happened, but just the impact of him going out of the game is one of your best, if not your best, defensive players. What did the defense look differently to you when he was no longer allowed to participate? Yeah, it's it's hard to judge it because, um, well, I'll say this. Uh, I think... Arkansas is building depth. I think their their pool, their talent pool at safety is building. When you got guys like Miles Slusher, a freshman, just a willing hitter, much like Catalan, mm-hmm. uh, things are looking up at safety. But I do believe that on the, the zone plays, when Mon had time to really study the field, go to a second, third, or fourth receiver, and they, the, the rush just couldn't get to him, that the, the breakdowns in the zone occurred. Or, or they just knew Weidemeyer looked like he was really – well attuned to where he needed to be uh, when there were there were times in the zone. And Hezekiah Jones was a big comeback. He had been hurt with Achilles or something, 
this was his first game back. Uh, he was his presence was huge for them in this game, and it was something I kind of underestimated going in. But but that wound up being big, and it's just hard to play tight zone when you've got that much time. The difference in the Ole Miss game was Arkansas got some pressure and moved Corral around, and they just couldn't do it against Mond. And they, they, as Sam pointed out after the game, they tried stuff. They, they did the man concepts. They brought different numbers of blitzers from yep. different angles and just could not get to them. And uh, any zone will start to break down when he, he has that amount of time. Um, if Catalan had been in the game, yeah, I think they'd have been a little tighter. And so uh, it, it clearly impacted them. And obviously you, you have to go deeper into your talent. Well, uh, and I, I, you, so you brought up depth, and I was wondering, watching that game, do you think they missed Jerry Jacobs at all on Saturday night? Yeah, yeah, I think there's no question they did. I mean, Hudson Clark was beaten a few times, and um, in some of the zone stuff, guys just got into space that that Mon could get the ball to. Uh, whoever tried to cover Weidermeyer, um, he's six five. He's just a really good tight end. He killed him. Uh, but, yeah, if Jerry Jacobs had been available, he would have added depth to the situation. Um, Monteric Brown being back helped. But if you got uh, Jerry Jacobs in there, uh, yeah, you got another body, um, seven in and out, keeping guys fresh would have def- definitely helped. Tom, before we let you go, uh, this has been a conversation that a lot of NFL people have had as of late. Uh, and it seems like well, the way Justin Fields has been playing, it's not – who far out of the realm of the possibility that he could get drafted over Trevor Lawrence? I mean, I think Trevor's still the consensus number one overall pick, but uh, as aging Matt Ryan keeps getting older, and I, I know that he's a great quarterback, and I mean, Trevor's from Georgia, man. What would you think about the possibility of being able to land a future stud in Trevor Lawrence to the Atlanta Falcons? Oh, you know I'm in favor of that. And Justin Fields, I mean, uh, I think – has a high-end passing talent of Lawrence, or close to it, but he's a better runner. Mm-hmm. Oh, I mean, I don't, I don't want to, you know, diminish the fact that Trevor Lawrence is also a, a really good runner. But either one of those two guys, and um, yeah, the Falcons, we have a talented franchise, especially offensively, and we're going to win some more games. So I don't think we're going to be in position to get the first pick. I think there's a lot. But, you know, both of the New York teams are going to pick before the, the Falcons. So I'm I'm starting to, unless we make some kind of trade, I'm starting to not even think about the fact that we might get a, a, a franchise, the next franchise quarterback. Next franchise quarterback. All right, man. Well, hey, as always, we appreciate your time, Tom. And we'll talk to you on Thursday as we get ready for the Tennessee Volunteers this weekend, man. Yeah, that sounds good, man. We'll break it down on Thursday. Talk all right, to you all. Tom. Man. Perfect, buddy.